I have a change. We made so many deviations up and down the lanes that I was quite tired and very glad when we saw Yamath. As we drew a little nearer and saw the whole adjacent prospect lying a straight low line under the sky, I hinted to Peggotty that a mound or so might have improved it. But Peggotty said that we must take things as we found them and she was proud to call herself a Yarmouth bloater. Here's my am, screamed Peggotty, growed out of knowledge. I did not feel that I knew him as well as he knew me because he had never come to our house. He was now a huge, strong fellow of six feet high, broad in proportion and round-shouldered, but with a simpering boy's face and curly light hair that gave him quite a sheepish look. Ham said, Yon's our house, Mas Davy. That's not it, said I. That ship-looking thing. That's it, Mas Davy, returned Ham. Peggotty opened a little door and showed me my bedroom. It was the most desirable bedroom ever seen with a little window, a little looking glass, just the right height for me, nailed against the wall and framed with oyster shells. A little bed, which there was just room enough to get into, and a blue mug on the table. One thing I particularly noticed in this delightful house was the smell of fish, which was so strong that when I took out my pocket handkerchief to wipe my nose, I found it smelled exactly as if it had wrapped up a lobster. On my imparting this discovery in confidence to Peggotty, she informed me that her brother dealt in lobsters, crabs and crawfish. Glad to see you, sir, said Mr. Peggotty the master of the house. You'll find us rough, sir, but you'll find us ready. I thanked him and replied that I was sure I should be happy in such a delightful place. How's your ma, sir? said Mr. Peggotty. Did you leave her pretty jolly? I gave Mr. Peggotty to understand that she was as jolly as I could wish and that she desired her compliments which was a polite fiction on my part. I'm much obliged to her, I'm sure, said Mr. Peggotty. Well, sir, if you can make out here for a fortnight, long why her, nodding at his sister, and Ham and little Emily, we shall be proud of your company. After tea, when the door was shut and all was made snug, Little Emily had overcome her shyness and was sitting by my side upon the lowest and least of the lockers, which was just large enough for us too, and just fitted into the chimney corner. Mrs. Peggotty was knitting on the opposite side of the fire. Peggotty, at her needlework, was also at home, as if they had never known any other roof. Ham was trying to recollect a scheme of telling fortunes with the dirty cards. Mrs. Peggotty was relaxing. I felt it was a time for conversation and confidence. Mr. Peggotty, says I. Sir, says he, did you give your son the name of Ham because you lived in a sort of ark? Mr. Peggotty seemed to think it a deep idea, but answered, no, sir, I never give him no name. Who gave him that name, then? said I, putting question number two to Mr. Peggotty. Why, sir, his father gave it him, said Mr. Peggotty. I thought you were his father. My brother Joe was his father, said Mr. Peggotty. Dead, Mr. Peggotty? I hinted after a respectful pause. Drowned dead, said Mr. Peggotty. I was so curious to know 
whether I was mistaken about his relationship to anybody else there, that I made up my mind to have it out with Mr. Peggotty. Little Emily, I said, glancing at her, she is your daughter, isn't she, Mr. Peggotty? No, sir, my brother-in-law Tom was her father. I couldn't help it. Dead, Mr. Peggotty? I hinted, after another respectful silence. Drown dead, said Mr. Peggotty. I felt the difficulty of resuming the subject, but had not got to the bottom of it yet, and must get to the bottom somehow. So I said, Haven't you any children, Mr. Peggotty? No, Master, he answered with a short laugh. I'm a bachelor? A bachelor? I said, astonished. Why, who's that, Mr. Peggotty? Pointing to the person in the apron who was knitting. That's a Mrs. Gummidge, said Mr. Peggotty. Gummidge, Mr. Peggotty? But at this point, Peggotty, I mean my own peculiar Peggotty, made such impressive motions to me not to ask any more questions, that I could only sit and look at all the silent company until it was time to go to bed. Then, in the privacy of my own little cabin, she informed me that Ham and Emily were an orphan nephew and niece whom my host had at different times adopted in their childhood, and that Mrs. Gummidge was the widow of his partner in a boat who had died very poor. He was but a poor man himself, said Peggotty, but as good as gold and as true as steel, those were his similes. The only subject, she informed me, on which he ever showed a violent temper was this generosity of his, and if it were ever referred to by any one of them, he struck the table with a heavy blow with his right hand. Almost as soon as the morning shone, I was out of bed and out with little Emily, picking up stones upon the beach. You are quite a sailor, I suppose, I said to Emily. I don't know that I supposed anything of the kind, but I felt it an act of gallantry to say something. No, replied Emily, shaking her head. I'm afraid of the sea. Afraid, I said, with a becoming air of boldness and looking very big at the mighty ocean. I ain't. Ah, but it's cruel, said Emily. I have seen it very cruel to some of our men. I have seen it tear a boat as big as our house all to pieces. I hope it wasn't the boat that... That father was drowned in, said Emily. No, not that one. I never see that boat. Nor him, I asked her. Little Emily shook her head. Not to remember. Here was a coincidence. I immediately went into an explanation how I had never seen my own father and how my mother and I had always lived by ourselves in the happiest state imaginable, and lived so then, and always meant to live so, and how my father's grave was in the churchyard near our house, and shaded by a tree beneath the boughs, of which I had walked and heard the birds sing many a pleasant morning. But there were some differences between Emily's orphanhood and mine, it appeared. She had lost her mother before her father, and where her father's grave was no one knew, except that it was somewhere in the depths of the sea. Besides, said Emily, your father was a gentleman and your mother is a lady, and my father was a fisherman and my mother was a fisherman's daughter, and my uncle Dan is a fisherman. Dan is Mr. Peggotty, is he? said I. Uncle Dan, yonder, 
answered Emily, nodding at the boat house. Yes, I mean him. He must be very good, I should think. Good, said Emily. If I was ever to be a lady, I'd give him a sky blue coat with diamond buttons, trousers, a red velvet waistcoat, a cocked hat, a large gold watch, a silver pipe, and a box of money. You would like to be a lady? I said. Emily looked at me and laughed and nodded. Yes, I should like it very much. We would all be gentlefolks together then. Me and Uncle and Ham and Mrs. Gummidge. We wouldn't mind then when there comes stormy weather. Not for our own sakes, I mean. We would for the poor fishermen's, to be sure, and we'd help them with money when they come to any hurt. This seemed to me to be a very satisfactory and therefore not at all improbable picture. I expressed my pleasure in the contemplation of it, and little Emily was emboldened to say shyly, Don't you think you are afraid of the sea now? I said, No, and I added, You don't seem to be either, though you say you are, for she was walking much too near the brink of a sort of old jetty or wooden causeway we had strolled upon, and I was afraid of her falling over. I'm not afraid in this way, said little Emily, but I wake when it blows and tremble to think of Uncle Dan and Ham and believe I hear em crying out for help. That's why I should like so much to be a lady. We made our way home to Mr. Peggotty's dwelling. Like two young Mavishis, Mr. Peggotty said. I knew this meant, in our local dialect, like two young thrushes and received it as a compliment. Of course I was in love with little Emily. I told Emily I adored her and that, unless she confessed she adored me, I should be reduced to the necessity of killing myself with a sword. She said she did, and I have no doubt she did. At last the day came for going home. I bore up against the separation from Mr. Peggotty and Mrs. Gummidge, but my agony of mind at leaving little Emily was piercing. We went arm in arm to the public house where the carrier put up and I promised on the road to write to her. We were greatly overcame at parting and if ever in my life I have made a void made in my heart, I had one made that day. Charles Dickens Adapted